Hi there, and welcome back to AP Chemistry. I'm Jeremy Krug, and in this lesson, we're learning about net ionic equations. Now, before we actually jump into that, we actually need to talk about something called electrolytes and how some compounds act as strong electrolytes and some are weak electrolytes and some are actually not electrolytes at all. We'll talk about what that means here in just a second. You know, most of the time when we carry out reactions in the chemistry laboratory, we normally carry them out in solution. And usually in general chemistry, we use water solution, you know, aqueous solution, since most substances tend to react more easily that way. So we have this uh, vocabulary word aqueous, which just means dissolved in water. So whenever you see a compound that's dissolved in water in a chemical equation, you'll hopefully find this aq in parentheses after the, the, the formula of the substance. AQ just stands for aqueous, and that just means that the substance has been dissolved in water. Now, for example, if we take a look at salt, just plain old sodium chloride, if you take solid salt and you dissolve it in water, well, it becomes NaCl aqueous. But that's not all. It actually undergoes another step. The sodium chloride, as it dissolves, actually breaks apart into its component ions. And so what you really have is not just NaCl aqueous, it actually breaks apart into sodium ions aqueous and chloride ions aqueous. And whenever you have a soluble ionic compound, that's what's going to happen to the compound as it dissolves. Now, ionic compounds are strong electrolytes. So what that means is when these ionic compounds dissolve in water, they undergo this dissociation process like we saw with sodium chloride. They break apart into their component ions. That's what dissociation means. Now, all ionic compounds technically are strong electrolytes because any time an ionic compound dissolves, even if it, if it doesn't dissolve very much, what does dissolve is going to break apart into its component ions. So in writing compounds, writing these formulas and these equations, if you see a soluble ionic compound, write it in its dissociated or in its ionic form. So what that means is if you have zinc nitrate, for example, well, we learned in the last lesson, and if you don't remember those solubility rules, you need to learn them. Make sure that you go back to that video and, and learn those solubility rules. Nitrates are soluble. So you know, zinc nitrate is soluble. It's going to dissolve and break apart into zinc ions. And then it's kind of hard to see there, but it's two nitrate ions, NO3 negatives. If we have sodium sulfide, well, anything that has an alkali metal ion in it is going to dissolve. So yes, that's going to break apart into its component ions. So we'll have two sodium ions and a sulfide ion. If we have lead to acetate, well, all acetates are soluble, aren't they? So that's going to dissociate into a lead 2 ion and two, because you know, there's a little two right here, two acetate ions. So this is the process of dissociation. When a soluble ionic compound you know, gets dissolved, you need to write it in its broken apart form or its dissociated form. Here's another one, magnesium fluoride. Uh, most fluorides are soluble except for just a few. So we break that apart and we have a magnesium ion and two fluoride ions. That's how you write it when it's in solution. Now, what if you get a compound that's not soluble? You know, phosphates are not soluble, generally speaking. Certainly not calcium phosphate. Well, don't break it apart. Just write it in its normal compound form. So that's how you can uh, tell if something needs to be written in dissociated form, broken apart, or in uh, compound form. It depends on if it's soluble or insoluble. Now, there are a few other compounds other than soluble ionic compounds that need to be written in their dissociated form, their ion form, when they're in aqueous solution. And probably the most common example of those would be strong acids. Strong acids are also strong electrolytes. Now, earlier in this course, we learned that compounds whose formulas start with hydrogen generally can be assumed to be uh, acids. Well, of all those acids out there, and there are hundreds, maybe thousands of acids that exist, or maybe more, who knows? Well, 
strong acids, there are only six of those. Only six. And so it's easy to learn what those six strong acids are. And, and, and here they are. Hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, hydroiodic acid. You know, and those halides are next to each other on the periodic table, so those are kind of easy to remember. And then we have these other three, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, and perchloric acid. Now, depending on whom you ask, there are some folks who throw in one or two other acids as strong acids, but these are the six strong acids that everybody agrees on. Now, what that means is when these acids exist in solution, you need to write them in their ionized form, in their dissociated form. So that means hydrochloric acid is really existing as H plus NCl negative whenever you write it out. Hydrobromic, same thing. H plus and Br negative. Hydroiodic, same thing, H plus, I negative. Nitric acid, I think you get the point. Sulfuric acid looks a little trickier because one of those H pluses falls off and we're left with HSO, HSO4 negative, that hydrogen sulfate ion. Perchloric acid is pretty simple, H plus and then the perchlorate ion. So strong acids are strong electrolytes. They dissociate when they're in solution. Also, we can say that all other acids are weak electrolytes. So all the other dozens or hundreds or thousands of acids that, that exist, they're weak acids, and so they're weak electrolytes. And so when you write them in a formula or as a formula in a reaction, you write them in their compound form. You don't write them ionized. We'll see some examples of that here in the next video. Now, if we talk about strong bases, those are also strong electrolytes. Now, there aren't that many strong bases. There are really only eight. These are the eight strong bases. And as you can see here, these are essentially the group one and two hydroxides, or at least the ones that are soluble. You know, there are a few hydroxides. Uh, group, there are a couple group two hydroxides that just aren't that soluble, so I, I left those off here. But these are the eight strong bases that you need to know. And just like the strong acids, they're going to dissociate when they're in solution. So you know, lithium hydroxide breaks apart. Sodium hydroxide breaks apart. Just same these others do. They will dissociate, they break apart into their ionic form. Calcium hydroxide gets you two hydroxides, you know, since there, there are two of those there. Strontium hydroxide does the same. We get a strontium ion and two hydroxides. Barium hydroxide, the same thing. Now these are ionic compounds, and so you may have been able to figure that out already, you know, but that's just how that works. Now, all other bases, and that's I have that hidden by the camera here, but all other bases are weak electrolytes. And as a result, they don't ionize very much. So what are the weak bases that we're talking about? Well, Weak bases could include the other hydroxides, but they could also include, more commonly, these weak bases that have nitrogen and hydrogen in them. So normally, if you see a compound that has nitrogen and hydrogen in it, you can pretty much predict that it's going to be a weak base. And so something like ammonia, NH3, it doesn't have a hydroxide in its formula, but I can tell it's a weak base because it has a nitrogen and a hydrogen. That, that's a pretty good tip off that it's going to be a weak base. Same thing with hydrazine, N2H4. It's a, it's a weak base. It's got the N and the H in there. Or something like this, methylamine. We have CH3NH2. You know, it has the N and the H. So these are some good examples of weak bases. Now, what is the summary of all this? Well, if we take the the strong electrolytes, you know, those soluble ionic compounds and the strong acids and the, the strong bases, those are your strong electrolytes. And then we have the weak electrolytes that really don't ionize much. Those are your weak acids and weak bases. Well, everything else is going to be a non-electrolyte. All other molecular compounds, that includes water. Those are non-electrolytes and they really don't ionize. So for example, sucrose or table sugar, C12, H22O11. It does dissolve in water, but it doesn't produce any ions to speak of whenever it dissolves in water. We can say the same thing for dinitrogen tetroxide. It's a molecular, a covalent compound. 
you just try to dissolve it in water, it's not going to ionize in any, in, a, in any serious fashion. Or methane, CH4, you can try to dissolve that in water. It really doesn't dissolve very well, to be honest. But uh, even if you can dissolve it, it's not going to ionize. There are no ions there. Uh, glucose, C6H12O6, it's the same thing. It, it's not a strong base, it's not a strong acid, it's not a soluble ionic compound, so it's a non-electrolyte. Water, another example of that. Uh, oxygen gas, you know, it, it does dissolve in water a little bit, but uh, it's not going to ionize into anything because there are just no ions there. So we can actually demonstrate this in the laboratory. If you have a strong electrolyte, like a soluble ionic compound, sodium chloride being probably a perfect example, you dissolve it in water, it will conduct electricity very well. We can actually observe that. If you have a weak electrolyte, it conducts electricity very weakly, and so not really that much at all. And non-electrolytes really don't conduct electricity at all. If you take distilled water, for example, pure distilled water, and try to pass a current of electricity through that, the water does not conduct the electricity, uh, contrary to what a lot of people think. Well, I hope you learned something about strong electrolytes and weak electrolytes and non-electrolytes and how you write them in chemical equations. If you learned something, please give me a thumbs up. If you haven't already done so, subscribe to my channel here. I'm uh, posting the entire AP Chemistry complete course on here, so hope that you can follow along and learn some general chemistry here. And if you're planning to take AP Chemistry, I want you to get a five on that test. I'm Jeremy Krug. Join me again on my channel where we can learn some more chemistry together.